the Rig Veda. There is a verse in the ninth mandala that goes, Yat Soma Chitra Muktyam Divyam Parthivam Vasu Tannaha Punana Abhara. And it means, O Soma, whatever wonderful, glorious wealth there be in heaven or in earth, you being purified, bring it to us. And it's not the only verse dedicated to this mysterious Soma, or as they call it in the north, Somras. If you tabulate the verses in the Rig Veda, in terms of which deity they are dedicated to, we find that there are 123 verses dedicated to Soma. Savitar, the deity to which the famous Gayatri Mantra is dedicated to, only has 11. So what is this Soma? And why is something that sounds like a drink have 123 verses dedicated to it in the Rig Veda? If you read through the other verses, it will also become clear that Soma is hallucinogenic, meaning that drinking it takes you on a bit of a trip. So historians and botanists have been trying for the last few centuries to find out what plant Soma came from. But what will surprise you is that there is a good chance that it was not a plant at all. It was a mushroom. Welcome to the science of mushrooms. Some experts now believe that the Rig Vedic deity slash hallucinogenic drink could have been made from the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Seen here looking like a kid's idea of a Christmas ornament. And this is based on the description of the hallucinatory effects described in the Rig Veda. Of course, that is not the mushroom you're likely to encounter at your grocery store because only a small proportion of the thousands of mushroom varieties that exist are actually edible. And a large number of them are dangerously poisonous. For instance, the suitably named death cap, also from the Amanita family, is responsible for the most number of mushroom-related deaths worldwide. It produces a toxin that destroys your liver and kidney. Then there is the false morel, Gynomitra esculenta, which is particularly dangerous because it looks exactly like the highly valuable and insanely delicious wild Himalayan morel. By the way, there's a restaurant near my house that serves this mushroom in a dish that costs 3,000 rupees. Mushrooms are fungi, a word that typically does not create very positive images in your mind. In fact, one common Tamil expression for mushrooms is nai kodai, which literally means dog's umbrella. Although, that would have to be a really large mushroom or a really small dog. But aside, we almost always associate fungi with infections or dead things. Mushrooms do grow on dead wood. And of course, spoilt food. And with good reason, if bacteria had a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from NIT, fungi have double PhDs from MIT. They can custom design and manufacture molecules that do some of the wildest things in nature. Let me give you some examples. Psilocybin, produced by about 200 varieties of mushrooms, popularly known as magic mushrooms, turns into a molecule called psilocin in your blood. And because it is similar to serotonin in structure, it activates those receptors, making you euphoric. What it also does is increase communication between parts of the brain that normally do not talk to each other. And scientists now believe that it likely creates new connections in your brain. First, what was originally a ritual practice became illegal and criminalized before scientists went. Oh wait, this might actually be good for treating certain kinds of mental health issues like anxiety and depression. Cordyceps is a kind of fungus that does something incredibly scary. It can take control of minds and make you do what the fungus wants you to do, effectively turning you into a zombie. Don't worry, it only does it to the brain of some insects like ants. But that did not stop us from using this idea in one of the best video games of all time, The Last of Us, which is set in a post-apocalyptic world where a mutant variety of cordyceps takes over human brains and turns us into zombie killers. So one psychedelic and one zombie killer example. But the third example will blow your mind. The ability of fungi to produce highly precise and sophisticated toxins is something that has played a central role in saving millions of human lives. In 1928, a Scottish researcher took a break from his lab and went on a vacation. 
when he returned, he found a petri dish that was growing a Staphylococcus bacteria, a bacteria that used to cause millions of deaths from infections, covered with a mold. What surprised him was that the area around the mold was completely clear, suggesting that the fungus had actually completely murdered the highly infectious bacteria. The name of this fungus, penicillin, and the Scottish researcher, Alexander Fleming. And that was the world's first antibiotic drug. It's hard to appreciate how many lives penicillin saved during World War II. Since penicillin, both fungi-based and soil bacteria-based molecules have gone on to become antibiotic drugs that have largely eliminated deaths from infectious diseases. And if you thought that was amazing, wait till you find out what fungi do in large forests. Do you remember the world of Pandora in the movie Avatar? The giant glowing plants all linked up like a neon party under the ground? Turns out that it is actually based on the real life biology of fungi in forests. Something called the wood wide web. Every tree in a forest is connected to each other by a web of super thin fungus threads, like microscopic noodle strands, reaching out and linking the roots of all the trees and plants in a forest. It's like a fungal Facebook where trees can share resources, send messages, and even help their younger trees, particularly their children, survive and thrive. These fungus threads called mycelium act like superhighways. Trees can send sugary snacks they make through photosynthesis down these highways. In return, the fungus offers internet services. It's a perfect trade. Big mother trees can even share extra goodies with their smaller saplings through the wood wide web. It's like giving them a little care package to help them get a strong start in life. In a big forest, the younger trees often don't get enough sunlight. It has also been observed that trees that lose branches or their trunk sometimes get sugars via the wood wide web from other trees so that they can grow more leaves and sustain themselves, like nurses taking care of a sick patient. And scientists now believe that trees might actually be sending each other not just food, but other kinds of messages, like warnings and even general gossip. Turns out trees are pretty social. Vegans, you might want to pay attention. So if you thought blowing your mind, taking control of your mind, killing bacteria, and running a geofiber for forest trees were the only things fungi could do, think again. It's single cell fungi called yeast that turn your dense dough into fluffy bread, and also turn grains and grapes into beer and wine. Fungal fermentation is at the heart of our food. When you add yeast to flour and water, here is what happens. Grains of wheat, like any other seed, contain an enzyme called amylase that breaks down starch into simple sugars like glucose, fructose, or maltose. Yeast likes simple sugars. It breaks down simple sugars into ethanol, that's alcohol, carbon dioxide, and energy. The carbon dioxide is what makes all the air holes in bread. If you're wondering what happens to the alcohol, it mostly evaporates in the oven when you bake the bread. The Italians, who have one of the oldest bread baking traditions, have a beautiful story about yeast. You take a dead flower, white in color, add water, and it is still dead. You then add a living thing, the yeast, and then the dough rises. When you put it in a hot oven, now the yeast dies and gives its life to bring the bread to life. A few other fungi rock stars that Indians might not be familiar with, Aspergillus is a mold that is used to make fermented products like soy sauce and miso, and Rhizopus is used to make a high-protein soy product called tempeh. Fun fact, the species of yeast, Saccharomyces, used to bake bread, brew beer, or make wine, is also used to make something called nutritional yeast. It is allowed to grow in a sugar-rich medium and then heated to kill the yeast and leave behind a yellow powder that is almost 50% protein and very rich in micronutrients and also tastes like cheese. So it's used to make vegan cheese without dairy and is also rich in glutamates, so it adds umami flavor to snacks, especially when people don't like seeing the word MSG on their packet. It's the same thing. Which finally brings us to the one kind of fungi that we started out with, mushrooms. Not the mind-altering ones, but the practical, edible ones that you can buy at your grocery store or grow yourself. The most common variety of mushroom you're likely to find in Indian grocery stores is the button mushroom. 
It's not the tastiest variety, to be honest. Oyster, Portobello, and Morel are way more tasty, but it's cheap and available all the time. Let's start with the nutritional qualities of button mushrooms. Now, 92% of a mushroom is water. The rest is a good mix of protein and non-starchy carbohydrates and fiber, which makes mushroom an excellent low-calorie, high-nutrient food that is good for your gut. Now, we've always assumed that mushrooms must be biologically close to plants. But an interesting thing to consider, mushrooms have texture and mouthfeel similar to meat. And it turns out it's because in the tree of evolution, DNA analysis shows us that fungi are closer to animals than to plants. So their protein structure is far more similar to that of meat. In fact, preserved mushrooms have a texture very similar to fish. And this vegan ceviche is a great example of that. The dense meaty texture of cooked mushrooms can mimic the mouthfeel and chewiness of meat, unlike the softer chalky texture of soy-based products that often have a distinct beany or grassy flavor profile, whereas mushrooms have a more neutral umami forward taste that is closer to meat. This is why mycoprotein, which is basically protein isolated from fungi, is now being looked at as an alternative option to purely soy isolate based protein. And along these lines, our newly found cousins, I mean mushrooms, naturally contain ergosterol, a provitamin that is structurally similar to cholesterol in animals. When mushrooms are exposed to UVB radiation from sunlight, the ergosterol undergoes a photochemical reaction that converts it to vitamin D2, ergocalciferol. You can watch my video on the science of vitamin D here. This process is similar to how human skin synthesizes vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, from cholesterol when exposed to sunlight. However, mushrooms produce vitamin D2, not D3, which is what we absorb and use more effectively. So exposing mushrooms to direct sunlight for as little as 15 to 30 minutes can significantly increase their vitamin D2 content by up to 100%. Slicing the mushrooms increases their surface area for greater UV exposure. The vitamin D2 levels remain stable in the mushrooms for up to a week when refrigerated and are not destroyed by cooking. Consuming these sun-tanned mushrooms provides a natural non-animal-based source of vitamin D that can help address deficiencies, especially for vegetarians and vegans. But just keep in mind that vitamin D2 is not as easily absorbable as vitamin D3, but it's better than not getting any. Now let's get to cooking mushrooms. To master how to cook them, it's important to understand their structure. If you look at the cross section of a mushroom, you will find a lot of gaps between cells that can absorb and hold any kind of fluid. So this is why it's best to not wash them for too long or they will absorb a lot of water and become soggy. This is also why it's better to heat them first in a dry pan for a little bit before adding a small amount of oil or butter. If you start with oil, then the mushroom will absorb all the oil and become greasy. Also, adding salt ahead will end up drying out the mushroom and they will become rubbery and chewy. So dry pan, heat mushrooms, then add butter or oil, and then let them nicely brown. Finally, salt. That's it. You can then use them in your other dishes. Mushrooms have a lot of nucleotides and glutamates, gives them an umami, savory flavor. If you like mushrooms, I'd suggest try and find a store that sells more than just button mushrooms. From shiitake, portobello, porcini, oyster, trumpet, and the expensive morel, the edible mushroom is truly remarkable. A huge range of textures, mouthfeel, and flavors. Neither plant nor animal. It's a separate kingdom of life that has been critical to human civilization, all the way from bread to beer to wine to antibiotics. And that's not all. India has one of the largest numbers of people that suffer from diabetes. And one thing that keeps them healthy and alive is insulin. A diabetic patient's pancreas does not produce enough insulin to bring your blood glucose to normal levels after you eat. So they have to inject insulin into their blood. Have you wondered where this insulin comes from? First, we isolate the insulin producing gene from human DNA. Then we take a small circular segment of DNA called a plasmid and insert this gene into that. Then we introduce this vector to a host. And I'll tell you what that is shortly 
and then give that host lots of sugar so it can multiply and as they multiply they produce human insulin. We then kill them and extract the human insulin and it's then further process to make the insulin injection. That host is a genetically modified Saccharomyces yeast, a fungi. Yes, a genetically modified fungus keeps diabetic Indians alive and healthy. As the Rig Veda once said, ni shatro soma vrishnyam ni shushmam ni vayastira dureva sato antiva. O soma, destroy the vigor, the energy and subsistence of our enemy, whether he be far off or near. We're not entirely sure what soma was. It might have been the Amanita muscaria mushroom. But in the modern context, it could be an antibiotic or insulin. Thank <laughs> you.